Hello. In this video, I'm going to talk about the regiochemistry of the Diels-Alder reaction. There's a lot that can be said uh, about the regiochemistry of Diels-Alder reactions, uh, and I'm only going to do two simple examples to just highlight the kind of approaches you can take. Uh, as the possible substitution patterns get more complicated, uh, then it becomes a little bit trickier to uh, sort out exactly what uh, might happen, but the same approach is going to work. Um, so as a way of an example, let's consider these two, this reaction here between uh, 2-methoxy-1,3-butadiene as a diene and uh, methyl vinyl ketone or, or uh, you know, 2, or, I'm sorry, 3-butene 2 ohm. Um, and if I've drawn the diene and the dienophile this way, it's going to suggest a certain uh, regiochemical outcome in the product. But there's nothing that says that I couldn't have flipped one of those reagents over and suggest a different regiochemical arrangement in the product. And you're always going to end up with a situation like this, where the uh, diene and the dienophile both have one substituent on them. So let's look at two different ways uh, that can be used to determine which one of these is the major product. First, we're going to look at resonance. Both the diene and the dienophile have other resonance contributors. And here is the most important resonance contributor of the diene, at least for our uh, discussions here. In this resonance contributor, you can see that... Uh, the lone pair on the oxygen is being delocalized into one of the pi bonds. And if you sit down and try to draw other resonance contributors to move this uh, formal negative charge to other portions in the diene, it's not going to work out very well. Okay. <clears throat> Likewise, the dienophile has several resonance structures, and I'm only showing the most important one that uh, for the particular discussion. Uh, and that is that the, you know, the electrons in the two pi bonds are delocalized. And so there's a resonant structure which moves one of the pi bonds up onto the oxygen as a lone pair and leaves a formal positive charge at the other end of the dienophile. With resonance contributors like these drawn, all it takes is lining up the opposing charges because negative charge and positive charge attract each other to generate the correct orientation that's going to yield the correct major product. And then, then you know, drawing it not with all, with all of the uh, formal charges and everything, but, you know, fixing up all of the resonance structures. Right. So then, uh, here is a different view looking at it from molecular orbital theory. Now, molecular orbital theory doesn't need resonance because molecular orbital theory delocalizes the electrons. Um, but it turns out that the molecular orbital theory explanation is complementary to the resonance explanation. Uh, and so here is the, the HOMO, the highest occupied molecular orbital of our diene. And you can see uh, that this HOMO is actually a little bit more complicated than the, the HOMO of 1,3-butadiene in that there's some contribution from the oxygen and even a little bit of contribution from the methyl group. But most of the HOMO is on the diene system itself. But the one thing I want to draw your attention to here is that one lobe of the diene is... One lobe of the orbital on the diene is bigger than the other. Uh, and it happens to be that same position where we would draw the negative charge and the resonance contributor. And then here is the LUMO of the dienophile. Uh, and it's a little bit tr trickier to see, uh, but the dienophile carbons are lined up where they are supposed to be. But because of the other, the carbonyl group, you also see an additional pi bond there, and even a little bit of contribution from the methyl group on the ketone. Um, but again, of the two dienophile carbons, one has a little bit bigger orbital lobe than the other. And so from the molecular orbital standpoint, you line up the larger lobe with the larger lobe because you're going to get more constructive orbital overlap when that happens. 
and it can get uh, much more complicated as the number of substituents uh, increases. But the, generally, these two approaches work, and, and the molecular orbital theory approach probably works better if you have access to the software that can calculate and, and uh, visualize these orbitals as things get more complicated. Let's just do one other example. Now, instead of uh, that diene having uh, its uh, substituent at the two position, it's at the one position. And I've used an ester instead of a ketone. Um, I'm only going to work through this from the resonance standpoint, but the molecular orbital standpoint will give a, will give a complementary picture and the same answer. Uh, so here are the two important resonance contributors. I would encourage you to sit down and, and make sure that you understand uh, how you can generate those resonance contributors from the original structure. But having the, the electron donating group at the end of the diene can actually put the negative charge on the far end of the diene. And then the dienophile has a similar resonance contributor to what we saw before. And so in this case, we end up you know, with a different regiochemical outcome where, but we're still getting there by lining up the, the opposing formal charges. And if you watched my video on my video series on the stereochemistry, you know, up through the endo role, uh, you'll be prepared for this stereochemical outcome as well, where uh, there is a tendency for the things that are pointing outward to rotate down and a thing, the, the electron withdrawing groups on the dienophile themselves to rotate down. And so you get this out endo cis arrangement. My final video in the Steele's Alder series is going to be about synthesis. And so being shown the structure of a diene and figuring out how to, or I'm sorry, but being shown the structure of a cyclohexene product and then being able to identify the diene and dienophile that were used to make it. Thank you for watching.